on Zoom. And still more people are coming in. So awesome. Yep, I'm going to get them in. More people. Full house, 632. Amazing. <laughs> All right, well, while there are a few more people come in, I'm just gonna introduce myself. I'm Leanne Payne, I'm the Executive Director of Wild Bird Trust. I've been uh, working with them since about the spring of 2018, helping to activate the Nature House and um, democratize the organization, create systems so that more um, community members can um, uh, get involved. Um, I see that one of our staff, Marissa Bishkoff, is on the, the Zoom, and uh, she's gonna. She's uh, one of the people that, if you were interested in getting more involved as a member um, in a volunteer capacity, you would email her at volunteer at wildbirdtrust.org, and she'll help you find the best spot for your skills and interests. Um, some of the work can be done on site and some of it you can do it from the comfort of your home. Um, and I've also been helping just sort of uh, develop, help develop some of the programs. Um, and, uh, and then we also have, um, oh, I wanted to make sure <laughs> that um, I thanked Melissa Hafting. Many of you will know Melissa. She's very engaged in the community, in the birder community, in the conservation community, and really very active at um, supporting young people uh, who have an interest in, in birds, in conservation, in um, uh, the planet. And so she, um, when we were looking for um, getting, getting more um, events for Vancouver Bird Week, um, uh, Liran was uh, one of her uh, suggestions and uh, so here we are tonight. Um, I'm going to now introduce uh, Nicole. Nicole Preisel is going to help uh, with some hosting tonight. Um, she is also a new um, staff person with uh, Wild Bird Trust as a digital communications coordinator and um, uh, she is also Squamish and Stolo and a bit of Katesy. Um, and it's very <laughs> important for us uh, that we um, engage uh, people from the local First Nations. Um, we're, as Wild Bird Trust is doing um, work to repair some of the, the um, harm of the past and uh, acknowledge that we, we live and work on the Tsleil-Waututh territory that uh, Wild Bird Trust um, uh, is located very close to the village site um, and are building a better relationship with Tsleil-Waututh in particular and Squamish and um, uh, so um, just really pleased to be um, in welcoming um, Nicole tonight and she's going to be a host with the yeah. event. Thank you so much yeah and I just um, uh, I'm so excited to be here uh, and be part of this. Uh, it's my first like event helping with the Wild Bird Trust and it's been so awesome just to meet Liron so far. So I hope everyone enjoys this. Um, I know Leanne, you touched on uh, being located on the unceded territories, but I just wanted to expand on that and say that, um, you know, as you know, people who reside on this land, it's important to um, take a moment, take time, find out whose land you're on. I'm currently um, on Bernie Mountain. I'm living on the uh, unceded traditional um, and ancestral territories of uh, the uh, Coquetzalam, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Stolo, Kwantlen, um, and Katsi uh, First Peoples. And for me, as both an Indigenous person and also having mixed settler heritage, it's always important to um, acknowledge the land. But, you know, beyond that, I think as people who are interested in nature and, and the animals and the wildlife, it's important to, you know, develop that relationship, um, that respectful and meaningful relationship with the, the land around us. So um, thank you guys so much for joining um, and, and and coming to watch Liron. I'm so excited. Uh, Leanna, is it okay if I introduce him? Yes, please. 
Perfect. Okay. So I'm just going to be reading um, Leron's bio. Uh, you may have seen him on CBC's The National, heard his voice on CBC Radio 1, or seen his work in publications such as Canadian Geographic Magazine, The Guardian, Geo Magazine, and others. At 20 years old, Liron is already an accomplished nature photographer. His work has been experienced by millions in some of the largest museums across the world, including the National or the Natural History Museum in London. That's really awesome. Uh, and the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Um, Liron uses his photos to educate on the importance of preserving the natural world for the continued health and existence um, of all who live on our planet. Um, and as a naturalist and a photographer, he feels it is his duty to show people the essence of Earth by thinking outside the box to create eye-catching images that connect people with the environment. Liron's work has been wildly recognized um, and awarded, sweeping the youth category of the 2018 um, Abon Obden uh, oh, photography, no. yeah, thank you, <laughs> uh, photography awards, um, and earning a highly commended designation in the prestigious Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Woo! Um, Liron currently studies biology at uh, University of British Columbia. Um, he's in his third year, I just learned that. <laughs> and as he continues to build upon his passion and commitment to the environment. So huge welcome to Liron, thank you so much for taking your time and energy. I know you're busy with school, but thank you so much. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Liron. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole, for the introduction. And thanks to Leanne and of course, Melissa and everyone who uh, went into making this happen. Um, hopefully my screen can be seen here. I'm just going to get this in full screen. Are we good? Yes. Great. So I'm super excited to be uh, presenting today uh, about the top birding spectacles that we are so lucky to have in this part of the world. Um, and I've definitely felt very fortunate to, uh, to reside in this part of the world, which is such an important area for so many different resident birds and even more migratory bird species that, uh, that move through this region each year. Um, coming up with a list of, you know, like the top spectacles, it's, it's very, you know, every person might have a different list um, and it's definitely difficult because we have so much going on here in British Columbia but this is kind of the, uh, the spectacles that I very much have enjoyed um, and and hopefully I'll be able to share them with you and share you know enough information for you to be able to uh, seek out some of them yourself. So I wanted to start with something that is going on right now as we speak um, which is shorebird migration. So our position here on on the coast uh, in the Pacific Northwest means that millions and millions of shorebirds pass through this region each year. The, they're mostly nesting up in, in the high Arctic tundra, you know, many of them all the way in the Arctic Circle, and some of them will go all the way down to, you know, southern South America uh, to spend the non-breeding season. Um, and lots of them stop here in British Columbia to refuel along their journey. Um, it all starts in, uh, in spring, and in the spring, the shorebirds are in their beautiful breeding colors and they're heading north, um, passing through areas like Boundary Bay, Roberts Bank, uh, you know, the Pacific Rim, outer coast of Vancouver Island, and so many other places. And here is a flock of sandpipers, western sandpipers, and, and a couple Dunlin in there too, that I photographed a few springs ago. Like I mentioned, you know, one of the nice things about observing shorebird migration in spring is that these birds are in their breeding colors. Um, the downside of observing in spring is that they pass through really, really quickly. So, you know, in a, in a span of just a few weeks, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of birds pass through, whereas in the fall, they really take their time and, uh, and move through over many months, um, you know, with juveniles moving first and then, the, uh, and then the adults coming. But in the spring, they're in a real rush, but they're always very active, very busy feeding. This one here has caught some kind of uh, worm type uh, organism in the mudflats and they're mostly feeding on on mostly microorganisms that in the mudflats that they get just by probing their bills up and down in the mud. Here's another look at a Dunlin uh, and I love photographing them when they enter tide pools because it makes for a really nice white uh, bright look with these nice reflections. 
Another species that migrates through uh, in the spring is the sanderling. Um, and these ones are, you know, you may see them even occasionally in pop culture. They're often the birds you see in movies running up and down the beach, you know, used to establish the scene of what a beach looks like. And they, when the wave crash, they run up the beach and then they run back down to the waves. And they move through quickly here in the spring in, uh, you know, April, May, early May is a good time. Um, and they are definitely, in my, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful shorebirds, these sanderlings. But one of the few that is perhaps more beautiful are these red knots, which you saw in the, in the opening slide as well. Uh, red knots are quite uncommon. They uh, have a few different populations and many of them are, are threatened. Um, and they undergo really, really incredible migrations. And like I said, they're quite uncommon here in British Columbia. But you know, just spending a lot of time on the coast over the years, I've been fortunate to encounter some flocks of them. Um, and these two are very actively feeding uh, in the Pacific Rim near Tofino in early May. One of, the, one of the things I like to do in my photography is kind of take a, a wider approach and, and look at birds within the context of their environment. So for these shorebirds, mudflats are a really critical habitat. It's, they need undisturbed, peaceful mudflats for feeding and for resting. So here is a flock of beautiful red knots resting on the mudflats near Tofino. Um, they have that, that ruddy red color in the spring, but when they return in the fall, they're a little harder to, uh, to spot because they, they've lost their breeding colors by then, and they're just kind of a, a more gray brown color. But uh, red knots are definitely one of my favorite shorebirds that, uh, that we occasionally get moving through this region. Uh, you know, I, I've said, you know, the sanderling is pretty and, and the red knot's a little prettier. This one might take the cake here. This is a Wilson's phalarope. And unlike the shorebirds that we've seen so far here, the Wilson's phalarope actually nests all throughout the, all throughout the interior of British Columbia. And uh, in Wilson's phalaropes, the uh, female is much more brightly colored than the male. And this is a female here. In most shorebirds, it's actually the, the two sec the males and females look fairly similar, but in the Wilson's phalarope and other phalarope species, the females are very, very vibrant and beautiful. And this one was swimming along in, in a nice shallow pond. This here is uh, the Fraser River Delta Boundary Bay, uh, which is an incredibly important stopover site, internationally recognized as a critical stopover area for shorebirds here on the Pacific Flyway. Um, and in the fall and late summer, it is such a great place and very close to us here in, in the Lower Mainland, such a great place to see shorebirds. And if you go there right now on the rising tide, you can go and you can see these flocks of shorebirds, mostly black-bellied plovers and western sandpipers, but there's so many other species mixed in with them as well. Uh, the shorebird migration in the fall picks up usually right around the start of July. I think this one was taken in the first or second week of July. Um, and the first birds to show up here in the, in the we call it fall migration because it's, it's after breeding season, but it, it begins in the summer. And the, the first ones to move through are these western sandpipers and in particular all the juveniles the young of the year they're the first ones to uh to come through sorry I, i'm getting that the other way around the adults are the first ones to come through and then the juveniles the the young of the year move through so the adults first then the juveniles and uh these are juveniles spending a lot of time on the flats i just like to uh lie down in the mud get all muddy and uh and let the tide bring the birds towards me. Um, you know, these birds are tired, they're flighty, and I, I like to observe them, but I, I don't like to disturb them because, you know, they're, this is an important stopover area for them and they need to refuel. So at, all throughout high school, um, in my summer break, you know, July, August, and even into the school season starting in September, October, I would take my bike out and put it on the train and the bus and go out to Boundary Bay and spend full days, hours upon hours, just lying down in the mud and let, letting these, the tide bring in these uh, shorebird flocks to me. And, uh, you know, some birds will just totally accept you into their environment when you're motionless. This here is a, another juvenile western sandpiper and it just landed right in front of me and for a split second was looking right down the, the barrel of the lens making for this photo. And over the years, I've also, you know, tried to get creative uh, with the photos that I'm taking. And lately, I really try to, to, you know, 
use less traditional light. So a lot of the times when, uh, when I'm photographing birds, um, and, and you know, generally accepted in bird photography is that to have the sun at your back or the, the bright source of light at your back makes for a nice photo because everything is evening, even, evenly lit and you can see all the details. But uh, having backlight or side light, especially early in the morning or late in the evening, can really make for a dramatic lighting scenario. Uh, if you've spent enough time watching water birds and, and shorebirds, you'll know that they often like to go to, to freshwater ponds or, or outflows where they'll bathe, and you'll see them splashing around. And every time that they finish bathing after, after they're clean, they jump up and they flap their wings really rapidly. Um, so whenever I see a sandpiper splashing around and, and bathing, I'm always holding my, my finger ready on the shutter for when it'll jump up and, uh, and flap its wings to, uh, to get the water dried off of its feathers. So that's what's going on here. Some of the uh, large flocks of shorebirds that move through this area are black-bellied plovers. Uh, these are much larger than the western sandpipers, but uh, you know, equally interesting and amazing birds. Um, and in breeding colors, they have these black bellies. You can see some of them here in this image still have a little bit of a, a black belly, um, but the non-breeding birds and the juveniles are just kind of an overall gray-brown color. Um, and you can see here kind of a classic Boundary Bay view of uh, the black bellied plovers in the front with Mount Baker rising in the background in Washington State across the border. Um, but the, the real treats for many bird watchers, including myself, about these flocks of black bellied plovers is that there's often other species mixed in that are, are substantially less common um, or just, you know, birds that you don't see very often. This here is a short-billed dowager. It is a regular bird uh, that moves through, but in comparison to the black-bellied plovers, there's a lot less of them. Um, and on this particular day, I spent a couple hours just lying in the mud waiting for the tide to bring this flock of black-bellied plovers towards me. And as they approached, uh, the short-billed dowager came up to the front and just started preening pretty much as close as my lens could focus. So it was a really great opportunity to capture those details in the feathers of this bird. You know, you can imagine a bird that's flying thousands upon thousands of kilometers. Uh, you can imagine that that would do a lot of wear and tear on their feathers. So they spend quite a bit of their downtime when they're not feeding, preening and, and cleaning up their feathers to make sure they're ready for, for migration. So the short-billed doucher, you know, it's less common than the black, than the black blade plovers, but it's not, it's not really a, a rare species, just, you know, one that's a little more scarce. Um, this here is an American golden plover. And it looks quite similar to the black bellied plovers, but as you can see, it is quite golden. Um, and in the, breeding, in the breeding season, they're even brighter. Uh, the breeding adults are brighter and they've got black bellies as well. And you know, any time of year, they're a beautiful bird. Um, and this one is quite a bit more uncommon. Um, and American golden plovers, you know, sometimes it's one in several thousand black bellied plovers out there. And because they're so similar, it just takes a lot of patience to scan through the flocks to, uh, to try to find one of these beautiful birds. This here is a Hudsonian godwit, also photographed at Boundary Bay. Um, and this is another one of those far northern tundra breeders that's flying all the way down south into the southern hemisphere. And godwits like this one are, are famous for their long upturned, slightly upturned bill that they use to probe through the mud and find little microscopic intertidal organisms. And this one was, uh, was a real treat um, this, it's a very rare bird here. Uh, this individual had been around for a few weeks and I'd seen it a few times, you know, being out there uh, more days than not, um, but I hadn't really managed any great pictures. Then this one was quite lucky because I was just out there photographing the shorebirds and all of a sudden it flew in with, uh, with several black blade plovers and landed quite close to where I was lying down on the mud, uh, which let me get this portrait of this remarkable bird. And sometimes these birds, you know, they're on their, potentially their first migration if they're a juvenile, like this young red-necked fowler oak. And, you know, there's a good chance that a lot of the time uh, when I'm observing that I might be the first human being that they've ever seen. And uh, as a result, some of them just don't know, I guess they don't know what to think, you, think of you. They, they, they don't really think much of you. And this was taken with uh, a, like a wide angle lens because the bird just came right up to me and I, I wanted to photograph it in the context of its environment. So I used a wide angle lens to capture this, uh, this beautiful juvenile red-necked phalarope 
another bird that nests in the very, very high Arctic. And we don't see too many red-necked phalaropes here because they, they often take the open ocean route, migrating over the open waters or, or down through the Salish Sea rather than coming inshore. Um, but occasionally we get to see them here and it's a real treat. So shoreward migration in the spring, you know, April, May, and then in the, in the fall from uh, July through into November sometimes. Um, but even in the winter, there's shorebirds to see. And it can be, honestly, sometimes the winter is when it's the most incredible time to observe, just because of the sheer number of birds that are sometimes out in the Fraser River Delta in the winter. Uh, I believe it's hundreds of thousands of Dunlin, uh, according to some estimates, are uh, using this region in the winter uh, and feeding on these mud flats. Um, and if you go as the tide is rising in the winter time, um, the birds are displaced from the mud flats where they're feeding and they form these really big flocks. And they, you may have seen videos of starlings in Europe in these big murmurations uh, kind of moving through the sky. These Dunlin here actually do the same thing. And it's a really, really remarkable thing to witness. Uh, these Dunlin that winter here in the Fraser River Delta. So unlike a lot of the other shorebirds, which fly much further south uh, to spend the winter, a lot of these Dunlin stay right around here in this region um, to, uh, to feed and spend the winter time. And they're already starting to come back in numbers, um, and there'll be just be more and more Dunlin arriving as, as we get closer to winter here. So that is the first uh, top birding spectacle that I want to talk about today, shoreward migration on the coast. And I wanted to start off with it because it's something that is, like I said, going on right now. Um, and if you go out on the rising tide, kind of close to high tide, uh, as long as the tide's not too high, to uh, the Boundary Bay or Brunswick Point, um, you know, it's a great, those are great places to, uh, to observe the shorebirds at this time of year. So, we are on. Um, yes. Can I just, um, do you want to just go through the, sh the uh, images and then take the questions at the end? Sure. Why don't we do, uh, okay. why don't we do maybe like one or two questions at the end of each section and then do some more questions at the very end? Okay. If there's, yeah. some co if there's questions coming there's some in. some questions, yeah. So <laughs> there's uh, one from some uh, Donna Clark who's on the Facebook. Uh, she just said, do you have a bird story from Maplewood Flats? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I will do. I'll get to one later. <laughs> yeah, and then um, can you describe the camp? This is from Leon. Can you describe the camera equipment you use and the settings that result in such wonderful photos? For sure. So I, it's a good thing to talk about. Uh, so most of my images here uh, have been taken with a Canon DSLR equipment and uh, a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Um, it's, you know, it's versatile. Um, it doesn't get me super close, but uh, with some patience, it gets me definitely close enough to the birds to get nice photos. So a, a Canon cameras, most of these are taken with a 7D Mark II, some of them a 5D Mark IV, and the 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And this image here, I was using a slow shutter speed uh, to capture that, that chaos and the blur of their wings, maybe like a 20th of a second shutter speed to really capture that motion. Um, normally when photographing birds in flight, it's nice to use a fast shutter speed to freeze the action. But in this case, I went for a slow shutter speed just to try to capture that, that motion that was going on. I do want to say with camera gear, um, you know, you can kind of spend an infinite amount of money on camera gear. But I do think it's really important to acknowledge that you can get incredible images with, you know, the most minimal gear out there. I've seen amazing photos taken, you know, even with cell phones. Um, of birds, you know, you may not be able to photograph everything that you see. Some birds might, you know, just not let you get close enough to, you know, we don't want to disturb them. So it's not worth going after birds that are skittish with a, with a you know, a, a camera like a cell phone. But, you know, based on what your gear is, find those birds that are, uh, that will work for your, your setup. And, you know, in here in Vancouver, we have so many parks where the birds are, are very friendly and used to people. So this is such a great place to, uh, where you can, you know, almost get great bird photos of any photo gear so yes great yeah um marissa um uh, uh, says beautiful photos what Thank was you. your spark bird that got you started into birding or bird photography it's a good question um i would say i didn't really have a, a spark bird um i kind of just grew up uh you know exploring the parks in in my neighborhood here in the lower mainland um, and just developed a general interest and fascination with the birds that I would see. 
um, there, there, it was just something that gradually came and all of a sudden exploded as, as a passion that I had. But unlike a lot of people, I never really had a spark for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Miriam says, can you explain what you mean by microscopical organisms? Can the birds see their food? Uh, so I would say the birds can probably not see a lot of the food that they're eating, these shorebirds. They're probing in the mud for tiny, tiny, tiny things. Um, uh, there's a kind of a layer in the mud called biofilm that's full of, uh, you know, nu nutritious little tiny organisms uh, that we can't see. I'm not an expert on, on what all of those may be, um, but uh, I would say they probably can't see a lot of them. Sometimes they'll get like a bigger worm like you saw in one of those pictures, but they can't see a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, and I'll move like, on to the I'll move yeah, on to the next great. section here, and then yeah, we can sure. do more. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thanks for the questions, everyone. It's so yeah. great to to engage with the audience. <laughs> so the next birding spectacle I uh, I want to talk about is breeding season in the interior of British Columbia, um, and perhaps the most uh, you know amazing experiences that I've had and that and that you can have. Uh, as, a, as a bird lover um, in, in this part of the world is being by a lake uh, in the early morning or late evening or at night and hearing those incredible haunting mournful calls of loons echoing across the water surface. And most lakes throughout the interior of British Columbia at, at the right elevations, you know, kind of those higher uh, boreal forest lakes have breeding loons and uh, camping throughout the interior in the in the you know early summer late spring it's just one of those magical sounds that i always look forward to hearing so this here is the common loon uh you know a very emblematic bird in this part of the world um and a bird that is migratory not to the same extent as the sandpipers which are you know flying across the entire earth um, but these birds are most of them spending the winter on the coast um, or other large bodies of water um, and then they fly into lakes and, and large ponds throughout the interior of the province to raise their young in the spring and summer. On this particular lake, uh, when, when I was there, I was noticing that every morning this stunning mist would form over the surface of the water. And uh, as soon as the sun would rise, it would light up this mist and just make for such a spectacular scene. But it would only be lit for, you know, 10, 20 minutes, maybe even less. Um, sometimes just a few minutes because the sun would burn it off very quickly. It's very fine fog and mist. So in order to photograph these loons in the mist, which I wanted to do, it required to be out there uh, well before the sun came up and to try to find the loons in the, in the semi-darkness. And uh, so I was ready for when the sun broke the horizon so I could photograph them. So here we have a loon and its chick and it's just, you know, one of these things that you can see it uh, on many lakes in the interior of British Columbia, and it's such a magical thing to witness. And here are two adult loons. They're often in pairs, um, and I was just entranced by the way the mist was just swirling around them so beautifully lit up by the sun scattering across the surface of the water. Um, and, you know, such a great way to, you know, having this mist, it just kind of makes for naturally beautiful scenes to photograph. As I was photographing them, I also wanted to get a little creative with the lighting. So it might be a little tricky at the first glance to see what's going on here. But uh, this loon had just come out of the water um, after a dive for fish or other aquatic invertebrates and the water it lifted up with, with its beak was illuminated by the glow of the sun, but the bird was swimming through kind of the, the reflection of some dark tree. So it was a very dark scene, but just a little bit of light was hitting the splash and the rim of the loon and it kind of made for a, a nice abstract scene. The image was almost black and white out of the camera, but I just pushed it all the way to be fully black and white, uh, just to really enhance and bring the attention to those you know, details in the water and the details in the, in the patterns of the loon. Uh, one of the, you know, loons are fairly abundant across lakes in the province, but perhaps a bird that you see even more uh, is this here. This is a red-necked grebe with its, with its beautiful chick. And it's another bird that, you know, most of them spend their winters on the coast and then fly inland to uh, lakes uh, where, they, where they raise their young. And like the loons, um, they, they change, and like the shorebirds, they really change their plumage 
uh, depending on the time of year. So, you know, in the spring, summer, they have this nice, beautiful, you know, reddish uh, color on, on their neck and breast, which they don't have in the winter. So it's nice to see. On smaller ponds, perhaps one of the most uh, entertaining birds to watch is the ruddy duck with these, you know, vibrant blue bills and this, this beautiful ruddy color um, and these, you know, contrasting cheeks. And the males have a really neat display that they do um, for the females where they beat their bill against their chest really, really fast and produce these bubbles that come flying out and they make a really funny sound. Um, and it's another one of those sounds that I, I just like, I associate when I think about, you know, birding in the interior of British Columbia and breeding season, I think of the yodels of loons and the, uh, the sounds of ruddy ducks displaying on the ponds. And uh, another beautiful bird that you find on ponds and marshes, this one here, the eared grebe. And I don't know if you can find a bird with more piercing eyes than an eared grebe. They've got these remarkable bright red eyes in, in the breeding season. Um, and they're also just really charismatic birds to, uh, to watch and found on, on many marshes throughout the interior of British Columbia. Of course, it's more than just these, you know, these pond and lake dwelling birds that you can find in the spring. Um, a lot of songbirds are very active, they're very vocal, and they're preparing to nest. And, you know, you've got little birds like this beautiful white-breasted nuthatch that is found in the interior, um, and always a fun one to look for in the spring. Um, and, you know, another incredible song, I really encourage, if you, if you haven't heard one before, you don't know what they sound like, to, uh, to listen to the song of a yellow-headed blackbird. It's one of the most remarkable sounds. It's very mechanical, um, and it's just a really amazing sound that you can hear um, throughout the interior in the spring. We actually have a small population of these that breed on the coast at Iona Island, so, per so that's a good place to look for them in the, in the spring and summer but they're much more widespread throughout the interior. Um, and, you know, one thing I've, you know, one thing you notice when you observe birds a lot is that, you know, they, they have behaviors and they often have routines that are somewhat predictable. Um, so after watching this male yellow-headed blackbird flying around the marsh for a while, I noticed that he had some favorite perches that he would often fly to and land on where he would sing. And he'd sing from one reed for a while and then fly to the next one and sing from that reed. And this kind of repetitive behavior allowed me to predict kind of where he would fly, uh, which let me, you know, set up and be ready for when he flew into this reed so I could capture his, uh, his wings open as he came in for a landing. A incredible migratory bird that we are so lucky to have here in Western, on the West Coast, uh, is the violet green swallow. Um, you know, it's just such a neat combination of colors to have these purples, these violets, and the green. Um, and they, you know, some swallows will arrive to uh, this region as early as winter, really, like February sometimes. But when you start to see the swallows arriving in numbers, maybe in, in March, um, it's always a sign that spring is on the way. And I always look forward to seeing these violet green swallows. And another migratory bird uh, is this, this guy here, a white-throated swift. Uh, they nest on large cliff faces. Um, and they can be very, very difficult to photograph because they fly so incredibly fast. You may have heard uh, the article that was uh, going around, uh, you know, a while ago about the common swift, a relative of the white-throated swift here, and how some individuals had been recorded flying nonstop for 11 months without landing. And it just goes to show how good these birds are at flight. So when they're speeding around the, uh, the air around these cliffs, they can be difficult to photograph. Um, and it definitely took quite a bit of patience and persistence and undeniably some luck to, uh, to get this photo of this swift um, flying around below the cliffs. And bird song, warbler song, is the third sound that I really associate with the uh, spring in the interior. This here is a Wilson's warbler singing, uh, you know, declaring his territory. Um, and I always love to hear the bird song return in the spring. At this time of year, you know, you hear birds calling a bit, but you don't hear too much song. So in the spring, it's really nice to, to hear them vocalize. Uh, we also have what is probably one of the most sought after birds in the world that nests throughout the uh, interior of British Columbia. And they can be very difficult to find for good reason. As you can see here, the great gray owl um, has remarkable camouflage. So sometimes all you can see when you're, when you're staring through your binoculars is just couple yellow eyes looking back at you from the tree bark. 
this here is a great grail on the hunt, just patience and patience waiting for something to happen. And this owl flew off, coming right towards me and dove into the grass, uh, looking for a, a bull at sunset. Um, there's some, one of my favorite family of birds, which perhaps is a little more unique, are these uh, grouse and uh, ptarmigan and quail, you know, the chickens. Um, they're really entertaining to watch, and so many of them have remarkable breeding displays. This here is a ruffed grouse, and you can see those incredible tail, flower, tail feathers and that ruff around the neck where they get their name from. And this here is a uh, endangered uh, species in British Columbia, the Colombian subspecies of the sharp-tailed grouse, another bird that is, uh, that is famous for its remarkable displays, uh, which so many birds in this family, these, these chickens, <laughs> these wild chickens have. Um, so this sharp-tailed grouse, another incredible bird. Of course, if you've been in the interior, you've probably noticed quail running around. Um, not a native species, but still a real joy to see. And perhaps one of the most difficult uh, birds in, in this family uh, to find, but the most rewarding, are ptarmigan. Um, and it's always a reminder when I go looking for ptarmigan in the breeding season, where, where all these other birds are, you know, in the heat and warmth in the valleys, that sometimes spring, summer arrives quite a bit later in the, uh, in the mountains. Um, oops. So this here is a video. Uh, this was a hike at the end of June in the Cascade Mountains here in British Columbia. And you can see just how uh, miserable the conditions were. Uh, I wasn't expecting to have this as a campsite, you know, being surrounded by ice. But uh, that's what it takes sometimes to try to track down these amazing birds. And this was the target. This here is the white-tailed ptarmigan, um, which is found throughout the Rocky Mountains, but is the most range-restricted ptarmigan in the world. Um, and it was just foggy, snowy conditions so after you've hiked all day to get to your campsite and you encounter one of these birds, it's, uh, it's a real treat. And like other grouse, they display um, in June and July and, and throughout the breeding season, the males are very excited and they're calling and screaming a lot and flying around and chasing each other. So they're such, such a thrill. Um, if you manage to get, uh, if you ever manage to get up into the high elevations, basically higher than where trees grow, that's where you start to find these remar remarkable birds. Um, you know, when you go further north, there's more elusive ptarmigan species. This here is the rock ptarmigan, which is a difficult species to find in British Columbia, but there's more of them up north. And perhaps the most stunning of the ptarmigan, this here is a willow ptarmigan uh, in the snow. But once again, you know, this is in mid-July, uh, but in these mountain uh, regions, there's often snow all the way through the summer around these glaciers. And perhaps, you know, ptarmigan, because they're famous for changing their feathers and their colors throughout the season. So in the winter, they're all white to blend in with the snow. And then in the summer, they turn all brown or gray brown to blend in with the rocks. So there's just these narrow windows in kind of the spring and fall where they stand out more um, kind of between their uh, changing of colors. So that concludes the second spectacle that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I'm going to go into the third spectacle here, which is coming up and happening right now, which is salmon season. And in particular, the amazing bald eagle gatherings that occur during salmon season. So these here are pink salmon, which are, you know. Sorry, uh, Lee Ron, yes. I was wondering, would you be comfortable answering just a few questions? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Before we begin? Yeah. I think everyone was just so blown away how um, <laughs> amazing you are. I'm just captivated listening, so. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go to where we left off. All right, uh, I think it was that sp the spark bird question. Um, oh yeah, here's, here it is, perfect. Um, people are just, again, saying how amazing you are at public speaking. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> and Leanne, uh, linked your website, perfect. Oh, so um, someone had a question, what time of morning do you get started? It very much depends, you know, what I'm going for, but I would generally say as a rule with birds, uh, you know, being up at sunrise is always a good idea. It's when they're most active, especially in the spring and summer. And it's also when the light is best for photography. So early mm. is best and also late in the evening can be good too. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, yeah, your photos speak for themselves. They are just amazing and they show the work you must have put into them, you know? <laughs> thank you so um, much. Yeah, perfect. Just looking 
I guess I guess most people are just saying how absolutely stunning your um, your uh, photographs are. Um, and yeah, no, I, I uh, do. You use a boat on the lakes? That's the last question. Uh, I do sometimes. Yes, it's always important. You know, when when we're going into the environment of the bird, that uh, you know we there's a couple of things to consider. One is, you know, that you're positioned well for photography, but more importantly, that you're in a scenario that's not going to disturb the bird. So mm -hmm. for the loons, for example, when photographing from a boat, uh, it's good to do so only in locations where the loons are, you know, kind of used to human presence. So lakes where yeah. there's lots of, you know, recreational, you know, fishing activity type of thing, often the loons are just very used to human presence in those places, but it's mm -hmm. always important to, uh, to be very respectful with loons and any birds when you're photographing yeah. them. Exactly. It, respectful of nature is so important. Yeah. It's a it's a relationship that we give and take, right? You have to Absolutely. respect and, and, and then, yeah. Well, wow, thank you so much. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I no, just knew that there great. were a lot of comments. And, and yeah, so if anyone has any questions, keep asking them. And uh, when uh, Liron finishes up, uh, we'll, we'll open up uh, for more questions. But thank you, Liron, and continue. Thank you. And I should say, if uh, anyone is interested, we I was on a panel for Bird Week last evening where we talked about responsible birding, and I talked briefly about responsible photography and photography ethics. So if you are interested in that, I believe the live stream is probably still up to uh, watch, uh, even after the fact, on, on some of the Bird Week channels, like on Facebook. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, responsible bird photography and bird photography ethics, which is, of course, critical in, this, uh, in, this, in these pursuits, uh, you can check that out. Um, so yeah, I'll go on now to uh, salmon season and the bald eagle gatherings. So these are pink salmon, which are one of our five or so uh, Pacific salmon species. And right now, as we speak as well, all these salmon are heading upstream from the oceans where they've lived their lives as adults back to the spawning grounds where they were born in the rivers to, uh, to lay eggs and fertilize those eggs and start the next generation. And it's an amazing thing to, to watch these salmon on their journey. Um, when I was photographing these in the river, I, I, you know, you see them in the river, but I don't know if I ever really appreciated just how much energy it must take for them to swim up the river because I could barely stand still and hold my ground here because the water was, didn't look that strong, but it was so strong. So to see these salmon just effortlessly swim upstream, it's, it's really remarkable. But uh, these salmon have such an important role in the ecosystem. And here you can see uh, what happens towards the end of the salmon run after these salmon are starting to die after, you know, spawning, um, it attracts so many eagles. I know over Zoom sometimes videos are a bit choppy, but uh, hopefully you can see kind of the, the number of eagles that, uh, that this can attract. Um, it can be in, the, in the, this southwest corner of British Columbia, there's sometimes tens of thousands, I think the estimates are like 30,000 sometimes eagles that move through during salmon season. Um, and eagles are often thought of resident birds. They don't have any big known migratory patterns, but uh, you know, ongoing research is actually determining uh, and, and finding out that these eagles are very much salmon eagles. And so many of them in, in kind of this part in the Pacific Northwest uh, spend the entire salmon season, basically starting in late spring and going all the way through New Year's. Uh, they spend that entire season following around the salmon runs. So when the salmon run starts kind of in early summer, even late spring in Alaska, there's birds gathered there. And, you know, as the year progresses, the salmon runs, you know, start to pick up further south and the eagles basically make their way down their coast from Alaska through Yukon, British Columbia, down into Washington State, basically just following these salmon, following the food source. And they are such remarkable birds to observe. Um, you know, such incredible, powerful looking, but, you know, majestic looking, but also kind of comical and, uh, and you know, interesting birds to observe uh, at times. Um, and my favorite thing to photograph when I'm photographing eagles are the interactions. You know, it's remarkable. Sometimes there'll just be hundreds and hundreds, thousands of salmon carcasses all over the place, but the eagles just can't help it. Uh, they have to try to chase each other around and scare each other off the carcasses. And you often see many battles break out um, as, these sam as these eagles are, uh, are feasting on, on the salmon. So I really love to, uh, to capture those moments like this one here and, uh, and this one here. And this was another case where I don't normally put my photos in black and white, but sometimes when there's just details to be focused on, I find, and not much color to begin with, um, I find it can just really help to emphasize, you know, what's the details and the action that's going on. 
Um, they make some pretty incredible maneuvers sometimes in these brief battles that break out over salmon carcasses, and you can see outstretched these talons. Um, I certainly would not want to mess with these talons, um, but some of these eagles that are residents are, are you know, quite used to the presence of people, and one time I just encountered an eagle sitting next to a trail, and it was just perfectly content with me up on the trail standing next to it, and I zoomed in on its talons and, uh, and took a picture of those talons just to show how <laughs> how uh, powerful they are. Uh, it's their tool that they use for, uh, for you know, grasping onto the salmon. Spending a lot of time over the years, I've been you know, photographing eagles as long as I can remember and spending, you know, dedicating quite a bit of time in the winter to them since maybe like 2013. Um, you occasionally encounter some interesting looking eagles. This one here is a, a, you know, a what we call a leucistic eagle. It's, it's missing some pigment and its feathers. This is a, a juvenile eagle. Um, so it doesn't, it would normally just kind of be a dark chocolate brown color, but it was, it was very pale and very beautiful. And, uh, and here's a, another individual like this, an adult, and you can see on, on the left is, you know, what a, a normal adult bald eagle will look like after they're around five or six years old. And on the right, this uh, leucistic eagle. Um, and, you know, they don't encounter them often, but, you know, when you spend a lot of time in nature, which in this part of the world, I, you know, I always encourage people to any time that you can, you know, we can learn so much from our environment and see so many amazing things. When you spend that time, you sometimes encounter these unusual things. And it's, it's, no, uh, it's no doubt, it's no wonder uh, why so many people come out each year to observe the eagles. Uh, the Fraser Valley Bald Eagle Festival happens every year and it draws out hundreds, probably thousands of people out to see this remarkable spectacle. Um, of course, Brackendale uh, in the Squamish area is also another great spot to observe the eagles. And it's always great to see, you know, such a passion that people have for uh, observing the birds. I don't know what's, what uh, is going to go on this year uh, with the pandemic, of course, but uh, I'm sure there'll be at least some virtual activities, hopefully. So these eagles are eating the salmon. Sorry, this photo might be a little gruesome, um, but you know, these eagles are consuming the salmon um, and they're not just eating these salmon and, and benefiting from the salmon, but they also play an important role for the entire ecosystem. So the eagles often capture the salmon, usually the carcasses when they're already dead, um, by the streams and they, and they fly up into the forest, into the surrounding forest to, to feed on them. And they'll often drop the scraps down into the forest floor. And as the salmon carcasses decompose, um, these nutrients are you know, seeping into the forest. And we know that these marine nutrients that these salmon bring from the sea into the rivers and then eagles and other animals bringing them into the forest, they're actually very important for the health and growth of our forest in this part of the world. Um, and, and regions that have healthy amounts of salmon have healthier forests and more forest growth and healthier trees. It's not only the eagles that uh, are benefiting from the salmon. Um, one of my favorite little birds to watch during salmon season on any stream where there's salmon spawning, often best in the, you know, the foothills of the mountains, you can find these little American dippers. It's an aquatic songbird and they dive underwater to, uh, to look for aquatic invertebrates and at this time of year, salmon eggs. Uh, so you can see here, and in this photo as well, the, uh, the dipper has a salmon egg in, in its bill. And uh, the salmon lay thousands, you know, two, three thousand uh, eggs or more or less, depending on the species. Um, and, you know, the reason why they lay so many is because only a few will survive to return to the uh, stream where they were born and, and lay the next generation of eggs. But these eggs sustain so many different animals. And of course, it's not just the birds, you know, when we're talking about salmon, we have to talk about all the other animals that they benefit as well. You know, animals like black bears and grizzly bears and even wolves throughout the province of British Columbia uh, enjoy feasting on salmon and are a very important resource for them when they're uh, getting ready for hibernation. And of course, our resident orcas, uh, this is one of the northern resident orcas, uh, the resident orcas in British Columbia, for them, salmon is, is a very important, and in some cases, they're only uh, real food source. So, you know, it's always important that we are, are doing our part to learn about and protect and conserve uh, the salmon in this part of the world because they, they have such an important role um, in, in the ecosystem. Um, before I go on to the final uh, highlight birding spectacle, I wanted to briefly mention a few honorable mentions. You know, when you're coming up with these top spectacles, 
uh, it's always a little difficult to pick your favorite ones. So I wanted to do a few honorable mentions um, that are definitely worth talking about and are so such enjoyable sites to witness. Um, starting with something that I've just seen today on social media is starting to get going, which is the snow goose migration. So uh, we live in one of the best places in the world if you're based uh, in, this, in this region um, to observe snow geese migrating as they go from their breeding grounds in, in Siberia and Russia and in the Arctic down through North America. Um, and not only are these individual birds beautiful, but the most beautiful part of them is when they form these massive flocks. And I find late October, uh, early November, kind of through October is when we have these peak numbers coming through. Sometimes you see flocks that have tens of thousands of snow geese in them. And they'll often, you know, gather in fields and, and salt marshes, you know, along the Richmond Dyke, around the Rifle Bird Sanctuary, throughout the fields in Delta. Um, and they gather to, uh, you know, feed on the grass, refuel on their journey. Um, but there's an event that occasionally happens that, that you know, a lot of people like to call blast off, which is when something spooks the geese, um, you know, hopefully something like a coyote and, or an eagle and not something human caused. Um, but in this case, it was a bald eagle that, that flew low over, spooking the geese and they all take to the air at once um, in this blast off. And for this image, I was using a, a slow shutter speed uh, to kind of capture that chaos as they erupted. And as they go up, they, you know, they fill this uh, sky with this sight that is similar to snow. You can see definitely, it's, it, this one's an obvious one as to where they got their name. Another honorable mention I wanted to give for a top birding spectacle in British Columbia uh, are the annual, is the annual gathering of surf scoters. Um, so right around now as well, uh, these birds are starting to arrive back to the British Columbia coast. A lot of them breed, you know, in the interior further north, um, and they spend, a lot of them spend the winter here in the Salish Sea, um, foraging on, around Vancouver, uh, primarily blue mussels uh, that they find on the, on the ocean floor. Um, and what's really special about these surf scoters is that they're found so close to downtown Vancouver. Um, of all these spectacles, this is one that you can literally people see out of their office windows um, if they're situated on the Vancouver waterfront, um, you know, where the, where the sea bus departs the terminal. There's sometimes thousands of surf scoters in uh, usually November is the best time for that. Um, and all around the Stanley Park seawall at this time of year, kind of mid-October through November into December especially, but all through the winter, you can see thousands of surf scoters that have gathered to, uh, to forage on the mussels. So that is definitely an incredible spectacle and one that uh, we're so lucky to have here. Another honorable mention that I, I wanted to give is pelagic birding. Um, this is perhaps a little less accessible in that you have to get out to the west coast and you have to get on a, a boat and, and take it 50, 60, 70 kilometers out into the open ocean. Uh, but once you're out there, there's some remarkable birds that can only be seen um, out in the open ocean. Birds like this sooty shearwater, a bird that breeds in New Zealand and basically circumnavigates the Pacific Ocean um, throughout the year, uh, with many of them passing through uh, British Columbia at most times of year. But uh, the one bird that I'm always really hoping to see, and is always the most magical thing to see out on the open ocean, are albatross. Um, up in the middle here is a black-footed albatross, um, you know, a bird with, uh, I believe it's like a six, seven foot wingspan. Um, and below it here is a pink-footed shearwater, which is probably more similar to the size of a seagull, uh, a gull, to give you a sense of scale here. Um, and it's just incredible to watch these albatross use their massive wingspan to just soar effortlessly over the surface of the water, um, just gliding over the water and doing loops up into the sky and coming around. They're really remarkable birds. And they're also incredible in that they nest in Hawaii and in these tropical islands in the, in the Pacific, kind of Central Pacific, um, but there's not a lot of food for them in those areas. So birds with chicks in the Hawaiian islands actually fly all the way to the coast of the Pacific Northwest, including off of British Columbia, off of like Tofino and Ukulet, to the continental shelf, where there's a lot of nutrient upwelling from the depths. Um, and they feed here, uh, you know, it might take them a day or two to get here. They'll feed here for, you know, a few days to a week, and then they fly back to their chick in Hawaii and feed them uh, the food that they gathered here. 
unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of plastics in the ocean these days and albatross uh, are quite vulnerable to uh, accidentally swallowing those plastics and, and not being able to differentiate them from, differentiate them from fish. Um, so, you know, we, we always have to be mindful of that uh, with our single use plastics and do everything we can to reduce uh, the impact that, that, that they have on birds like these albatross. And the final honorable mention uh, that I wanted to do before I get into the final highlight uh, is spring songbird migration throughout the province, but uh, in, in uh, urban parks, parks like Maplewood Flats, um, parks like Queen Elizabeth Park and, and Stanley Park, Burnaby Mountain, um, are just real concentration, get these real concentrations of migratory songbirds like this yellow rumped warbler in the spring um, and in the fall too, but uh, it, 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 higher numbers in the spring. Um, and when you get kind of a, a rainy, a rainy night, these birds are migrating at night. So if you get a rainy night and rainy early dawn hours, um, often these birds will what we call fall out where they, they leave their migratory path in the sky and they look for a place to land and they often end up in these parks. Um, and if you got nice weather conditions in the morning after that rain, that's when you really start to see them come out. Um, and it can be a remarkable thing. And of course, it's not just warblers that we see in these parks, but places like Maplewood Flats have breeding purple martins, another really beautiful and amazing bird. And this is a photograph of a, a purple martin in flight with a, what might be more than one, potentially a couple, damsel flies in its bill. So the final birding spectacle here that I wanted to, to uh, mention as one of my top spectacles is uh, something that happens right here in the lower mainland, which is the nightly crow roost uh, this at Still Creek in Burnaby. Um, and it's a spectacle that you're, if, you, if you're from the uh, greater Vancouver area, you've probably observed some aspect of it um, in the evening hours, if you're in Vancouver, you see all these crows heading east, and if you're on the other, if you're on the east side of Burnaby, maybe you're seeing them head west, all heading to the Still Creek Rookery. Um, and there's been some estimates that there's tens of thousands, potentially on some nights in the winter, you know, upwards of 30,000 birds coming to roost in this area. Um, they gather in the parking lots, and you can see here, you know, I, I can only imagine what people seeing this for the first time are, are thinking, you know, maybe not know what's going on. Um, it's just, it's remarkable. Um, they gather in the, in the treetops and, and on towers and on traffic lights as the sun is setting and they make their way across the highway at Still Creek. Uh, and, and on they go, thousands and thousands of them. And they head into the trees where they spend the night um, and, you know, this is one of those things that if you're from the Lower Mainland and you haven't yet seen it, it is such an incredible spectacle. And it's a great testament to just how amazing of a place, uh, you know, we're fortunate to be based on here. Um, the, these lands are truly remarkable for bird life. And even with the, you know, the, the, the de de development and urbanization in cities here, there are remarkable birding spectacles that you can see right in the city of Vancouver. Um, and winter time is the best time to see these crows roosting for a couple reasons. Uh, one of them is that there's no leaves on the trees, so they really stand out. And the other reason is that um, the birds aren't nesting. So when they have nests, they will stay at their nests uh, to care for their eggs and care for their youngs. But when they're not nesting, pretty much all the crows, the vast majority of them in the lower mainland, go to Still Creek to roost. Um, and it's really an incredible thing. And I've, I've really enjoyed observing them and photographing them here as they land in the trees, you know, with the city lights in the back. And again, getting creative with some parking lot lights uh, behind the crow, illuminating it from behind and creating this rim lighting. And uh, this image here is some parking lot, light, parking lot lights lighting the crow from the front. Um, and, you know, these crows are remarkable. They're highly intelligent. And uh, just one of those things uh, that is, is so accessible in that it's right in the city, close to where so many people live. And it's really one of those things that makes you appreciate uh, birds and birding and this part of the world. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for listening. It's been a real honor and pleasure to uh, present to you all today. And it's so great that you know we can do this during the pandemic on Zoom and get potentially even more people uh, listening, uh, 
and uh, you know to these things and uh, exposed to the birds. And you know, I want to encourage everyone watching, if you are a bird lover, which I'm sure you all are, to uh, go out, take pictures yourself, and share them on social media, and share them with your friends and family, and just you know pass on the love and the conservation messages, uh, and you know the respect for the environment that we really need in this day and age. So thank you so much, uh, and yeah, thank you for listening. And I think I guess if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer some more. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Liron. That was thank you. And sorry, Rob. I think I interrupted you, but it was that was absolutely. <laughs> amazing um so captivating and even uh my roommate was uh listening in uh, <laughs> you were going like wow that's so cool um yeah um i'm gonna read through some of the questions for you and then if anyone wasn't able to write them uh when i'm done reading through all the ones in the chat uh i think there might be a, a way you can raise your hand and i can always uh call on you but um if not uh, write your questions in the chat. Uh, one thing I wanted to say really quick was um, actually a Squamish elder told me a really amazing story about um, the crow roost and like uh, kind of why they go there. So maybe one day if we meet in the future, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, yeah, that would be incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. Um, and it's more of like a, I don't like using the word legend, but maybe more of like a yeah. older story of of how they thought so yeah that's really cool okay so yeah so lots of just stunning colors obviously amazing <laughs> um so i think we left off on the boat one uh so this one's from shannon noble how do you maintain patience over a lengthy period of time when you are by yourself do you get anxious or are you used to this uh that your thoughts are rather singular um or are they silent and observing uh wondering it's a really good question. And I think it very much depends on the scenario. Um, I think a lot of the time when I'm waiting for something to happen, you know, I'm just in such an amazing place and there's just a lot going on that it's, you know, it's, it's just such an enjoyable experience just to be there, a camera or not, um, just to take in the surroundings and the birds and the nature that's around me. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, in, in these amazing natural places, it, it's hard to, uh, to not be fascinated, regardless of how long you're waiting. Um, but you know, there are times, you know, sometimes you're in a blind, so you're kind of separated from your surroundings because you need to be hidden uh, as to not disturb the birds. So sometimes, you know, it can get a little tedious at times. Um, but you know, it's always a good time just to, to think and reflect and, and look forward to what's going to happen. Um, and I, and I, I fully recognize that, you know, patience isn't for everyone. And the great thing about birds is that, uh, you know, patience can be great. But you also don't necessarily need patience to see some amazing things. So, so true. I think that's such a good point. And even if you go out for a 10, 15 minute walk and you just kind of stare up at the trees while you're going, I think that that's also a great way just to, um, if you're not like the person who can sit still, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Thank you, Leon. Okay, the next question is from uh, Marissa Bischoff. Uh, what do you think is the most pertinent threat to birds in BC? Uh, and the lower mainland? It's a, it's a good question. Um, and I think it's very hard to pick one. Uh, unfortunately, the birds are facing a lot of threats, but a few of them would be, one of them obviously is climate change. Um, so the, the changing climate patterns are altering uh, a lot of things, um, including the snow accumulation in the winter, which you know can affect the water flow for the rest of the year in the rivers, which can have an impact on the salmon. Um, you know, the uh, unsustainable exploitation of natural resources is probably one of the biggest things in BC. So, you know, there, you know we, we kind of, as our society, we do need resources, but the way that we operate is often quite unsustainable, the way that we, uh, we manage our forests and, our, and the salmon and these ecosystems. So I would say uh, in British Columbia, looking towards a more sustainable future in, uh, in the way we use our resources uh, will be particularly important um, for the birds. <laughs> yes, and I agree. I definitely second that. And I think, um, yeah, we can all play a part too, you know, um, even if it's just bringing out a plastic bag when you go for walks and cleaning up trash that you see, it's, it can be as easy as that, right? Um, Absolutely. So yeah, thank you. You are just a wealth of knowledge. I am <laughs> 
So I'm not surprised, but I am amazed. So yeah, I mean, you've obviously dedicated a lot of your life to this. So it's awesome to see your passion come through. Thank you. Um, it means a lot. <laughs> aw. So this one's from Janice Tong. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I missed one. Uh, this is from Camila. How do I get involved uh, or how do I get into bird watching? I have no experience. It's a great, great question. And the good news is that there's never been a better time, I think, where it's, I, I don't think it's ever been more accessible. Um, you know, you're at a bird week event. So what can I say? It, it's, a, it's a great start, you know, attending community events like this. Um, if you're interested in learning about the birds in your area and uh, how to identify them, there's a lot of free websites and apps that you can use. So the Merlin app, uh, it's developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's free and it's a really great app. It has all the birds found in this region and a lot of other regions in the world. It has, you know, where they're located what, and it has photos of them and it has their sounds, what they listen, what they sound like. And uh, it even has a feature where you can, you know, It'll ask you questions about what did the bird look like? Was it on the ground? Was mm -hmm. it free? How big was it? And it'll come up with some suggestions of, of what it, it was you may have seen. So apps like that are great. And if you uh, want to buy a field guide, a, a physical book can be a really great resource as well. And another website that I would point people towards to you know, see and learn where birds have been seen around their area is ebird.org. Uh, it's a really great website for looking at hot spots around you and you know, what birds have been seen in your area. Yes, perfect. And my my roommate, who's also excitedly listening to you, <laughs> right now is also suggesting um, checking out if there's local estuaries around you, um, the Squamish estuary. That's an amazing place. Or even just um, picking one bird to learn about, and you know, and exploring that. You know, that's um, a good way to learn. If you just start with one, and you kind of learn all the facts about it, and spend time kind of spotting them, sooner or later you're gonna, whether it's on the app or a website or who <laughs> knows, it's it'll come to you, right? So Absolutely. thank you. Okay, so um, Janice Tong asked, do you usually use a tripod for your shots? How do you manage the weight of the heavy, heavy camera gear on some possibly long hikes? I started taking photos and after a few weeks, I already have a sore wrist. Amazing photos. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I would say the gear I use isn't too heavy. Um, the 100 to 400 millimeter lens that I use, I think it only weighs like two point something pounds, 2.7 pounds maybe, which, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's not too heavy. I understand for some people that might be a bit of a challenge. Um, there are tools that we can use to, you know, help us manage weight, uh, like a harness system. I use a system called con carrier where, you know, it, the camera will sit on your chest and it kind of distributes the weight around your, your back and your body. Um, it makes it more comfortable, uh, or just carrying a camera in a backpack can help. Um, but the other thing I would say is if, if weight is a problem, uh, you know, you know, these high end lenses do tend to be heavier, but uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, downscaling and using, you know, even like a bridge hybrid point and shoot camera can be really great for taking pictures of birds. It's definitely a good option if, if you know, weight is a limiting factor in your photography. <laughs> yeah, no, great, great advice. I think that it's so true. I, my uncle himself has a bit of a back injury, can't carry a lot on his back and he just brings his like little point and shoot out and yeah. you'd be surprised how good you can get some shots, you know? And Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Um, this one's from Frank Lynn, uh, incredible photos, Leron. Uh, expanding on Janice's question, do you have any recommendations for tripods and how do you keep your gear protected from wet weather? That's a good question good for question. you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I forgot to address the tripod. So I, because I'm kind of very comfortable with the weight of my gear, it's not too heavy, I don't tend to use tripods too often. Uh, for me, the scenario where I'm using tripods is if it's really low light and, and I, I need to use a shutter speed that's too slow for me to just hold it, um, I will use a tripod. Or if I'm just in a scenario where I'm not moving around much, I'm waiting like in a blind for a long period of time, uh, a tripod can be nice just so I don't have to hold my camera. Um, what was the second part of the question? What was yeah, that? sorry. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, uh, any recommendations for tripod okay. and how do you keep your gear protected from the wet right. weather? Um, yeah. so recommend recommendations for tripods is a tricky one just because there are so, so many options. Um, and you know, they range from 
15, $20 to thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's kind of a difficult, you know, I could do a whole presentation on that. Um, but I would say a good start is just to go to your local camera store and, and feel some of them and, you know, see what the price ranges are and how they feel. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of photography gear, durability and, and lifespan comes with more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, so I, I would, you know, I spent a lot of years just using cheap tripods and, you know, they would last a year and break. And then I, you know, eventually saved up and invested something more durable. And it's, you know, now that lasted me like five years. Um, yeah. So for the rain, a lot of cameras these days are actually more weatherproof than you would think, um, you know, especially more expensive ones. But uh, I would say it's important here because we get a lot of rain to protect your camera. So a couple solutions, um, you can get really cheap, just, you know, unfortunately plastic, but they can last for years and years coverings for your camera you know something in the five to ten dollar range uh, that'll keep your camera nice and dry uh, or if you're in the market for it there's companies out there like aquatech that make like these more you know fabricy, durable you know lifetime lasting rain shields that uh, that fit over your camera i use one from a company called aquatech so if you google uh you know rain shield for your camera um there are some designs out there that work quite well nice thank you you know more uh, about every, <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. You know, like so much, it's not just birds. <laughs> also camera gear and everything, that's amazing. Um, this person said, uh, Sarah Ross said, uh, long exposure snow geese, love this, I know. Those, <laughs> I'm still blown away. Like, Thank I, you. <laughs> if I was unmuted, you would have just heard me every two minutes, I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> Um, and, uh, Leah, um, uh, A. Gillespie said, great film on Albatross, Albatross the film. I think it, that's the name of the film. Okay. So if anyone's interested, yeah, that might be a good one to check Have out. To check it out. Yeah. Um, Rob Alexander said, thanks, Leron, for the amazing show of birds. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> yeah. That, it, it's, it is amazing. You're welcome, Leron. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nicholas D said, uh, Camila, I would start small, learn, I think she's responding to, uh, the previous question, um, learn, uh, which birds you can find right in your neighborhood. And as Leron said, you don't need expensive gear to start with bird photography. Yes, that's so true. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then Joan said, amazing. Thanks. What are your studying plans? Um, <laughs> if you want to explain what you're studying at UBC. Yeah. So I'm studying biology, um, third year at the University of British Columbia. I'm, you know, kind of hoping to focus on wildlife biology and ecology, um, which I think are, are very ap applicable to, uh, to being a nature photographer, because I would definitely say that having an understanding of birds and the animals and the ecosystems that, that, you know, I'm, that I'm working in uh, is really important and, uh, and often an undervalued aspect of getting good photos. Um, kind of in the long term, I, uh, I am hoping to, uh, you know, pursue photography uh, with that background of biology. Nice. That's awesome. It sounds like you already have so much, so I'm assuming <laughs> school hopefully won't be too hard for you because <laughs> you got a good basis. Um, Nicholas D said, I used to work near Renfrew Skytrain um, and saw the crow commute every morning. Uh, they're fascinating birds. I know. It's, Absolutely. Um, I used to live in False Creek and they fly right over top of my apartment building and uh, it was so cool every night, uh, you know, and I'd be like studying and then I would just look up and see, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of them. So cool. <laughs> it's stunning, yeah. <laughs> um, perfect. So uh, lots of people just applauding you, <laughs> clapping. Thank you. <laughs> I second that. Uh, fabulous and inspiring work, Leron. That's from A. Gillespie. Um, Pramjeet said, thank you for, uh, thank you. This is so enjoyable and inspiring. I, I so agree with that. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I'm, I think I pronounced, I can't read. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> it's actually para, param, Paramjit. So sorry if I and pronounced your name wrong. Uh, I apologize. Deborah Walker said, huge applause. This was amazing presentation and so looking forward to all the things you do in the future. Uh, yes, for sure. Um, uh, let's see. I'm just going to see if there's any questions. Lots of people say way to go. <laughs> um, there's just one more question, I think. Okay, sweet. From, uh, John Prasel. <laughs> oh <Uncle>. my God. <laughs> Hi, uncle. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, he's just, um, I finally got to see a few western tanagers up here on the Sunshine Coast during the spring migration. Did you see any this year? An excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, western tanagers are so stunning, aren't they? I did see a few uh, this year in the spring migration as well uh, in, in Queen Elizabeth Park. Um, and yeah, they are so spectacular. We're, you know, we're, we're so lucky to have you know, you wouldn't often think of a, a red and yellow bird as, as being something that you could see in, in this part of the world. You know, people often think of it as something tropical, yeah. um, but uh, we, we get them here and they're just so stunning. Yeah, I think it was the Western <laughs> Tanager cool. that we had a huge flock um, one day that Rob Yeah, at Maplewood. I, I wasn't there, but I heard about <laughs> it that there were like 600 or something stunning. or more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, phenomenal. Well, it's uh, ten. It's cl getting close to eight. Uh, and I know you are a busy student, and um, you've already shared so much wealth of knowledge and beautiful, beautiful shots. Um, just really thank lifted you. everyone's hearts today. Um, so I just wanted to thank you on behalf of Maplewood Flats um, and Wildbird Trust to BC, and everyone who's been viewing. I share their their uh, thanks. Thanks to Nicole for helping to host. Yes, thank you so uh, much. <laughs> I also wanted to again thank Melissa Hafting for helping to connect us and and make this uh, event uh, happen with us. So uh, happy Vancouver. Thank you, and also <laughs> encourage people to check out the, the the talk tomorrow night from Kevin Bell um, about the history of the Purple Martins. Um, and um, please, if you're not a member, certainly we encourage you to check out wildbirdtrust.org and become a member uh, or, or just visit our site um, and, uh, or make a donation. <laughs> anyway, we really appreciate everyone's interest. Uh, clearly, there's so many of us that care about these birds and you've, you've really helped us learn more about them tonight, uh, Liron. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank Thanks you so everyone. Much, Liron. All right, and so Thank I'm you. gonna end up <laughs> the close up the events, the and uh, the recordings, and off we will. <laughs>